What's going on you guys? It's Scott from Fly Rides. I am out again in Foothill Ranch today at the Bosch headquarters, the brand new grand opening of the Bosch American headquarters and their fifth anniversary of Bosch e-bike systems coming to the United States. We have been partying all day here, checking out the new 2020 Bosch products and hearing about where the future of Bosch is going, where they think EMTB racing is gonna happen, where custom e-bike designs might fit into the Bosch perspective, and also just where Bosch sees technology in the e-bike sphere going in general. Like this video and subscribe to this channel if you want more Bosch content. We have always got a ton coming out. And make sure to let us know what you wanna see in the comments below. Let's check out the best of the Bosch fifth anniversary. I went from a hater to a believer, and it only took an inspiring story and a test drive, truly. I mean, it was minutes before I really, it really clicked with me. And I understood it. I didn't understand the concept of what an e-bike was, and once I did, and once I got on it, the rest is history. I just fell in love with it. Great transportation. Again, didn't have to use my car. I just began to find little ways, little pockets of life to really use the e-bike because I wasn't able to use my car. And all these people that kept coming into my life and all of these stories, more importantly, kept coming into my, into my life. Lots of them fit active people that were using the e-bike in so many different dynamics. I'm either sitting, creating content, writing or podcasting or uh, blogging or anything creation-wise, or I'm creating active vacations for people. So I'm either out of the Alps hiking or I'm home sitting and creating content. And what I found in the last couple of years, especially the last five years, is my body started to really ache. And I thought, oh boy, I'm 52, here we go. This is what they talk about. The aches and pains are coming, I'm getting old. Oh, this stinks can't believe it. Well, what interestingly enough, it wasn't just in a month, but within this first month challenge, I did start to see because I was moving more, the aches and pains really subsiding because I wasn't sitting in enough. One of my goals with this challenge was to boost my NEAT factor, my non-exercise activity thermogenesis. NEAT is an easier way to say it. So anything outside of sleeping, eating, or sport-like exercise. And what I found was I was able to ride and do my errands, right? Go to UPS, ship my packages, go to, to anything, shopping, to the gym, any kind of errand. I would used to write, go to ride to Starbucks. And eventually I'm like, oh, there's a lot of coffee shops in Tucson. I think I'm gonna explore. So I would end up riding a lot farther. And what that transpired was I was able to get my creative juices flowing before I went to that coffee shop to go sit down and write for the rest of the day. When I was done writing, I'd come back and kind of defrag and de-stress after a day of work. So profound effect on my need factor. I was able to boost my activity during the day. And I can happily say right now, I don't have any aches and pains because I'm still riding that e-bike. Still riding that e-bike daily, and I still make a plan of moving regularly during the day outside of my regular exercise. Uh, so my name is Alan Lim. I'm an exercise physiologist by training. I'm also the founder of Scratch Labs. I spent most of my career training pro cyclists, and it's kind of all I ever wanted to do. Uh, but around 2010, uh, I kind of gave it up, started this new company, but made this general rule. And the rule was that if an athlete asked me to help them, and I could help them, I would do my best to try to help them. Last year, an athlete named TJ Van Garderen who's finished top five in the Tour de France twice, came to me and asked if I would help them. To support riders in the past, what I've always done is I've always used a scooter to motor pace athletes. And the reason why we use a scooter is because we're trying to create uh, the specificity of a moving peloton. The issue is, is how do you prepare athletes for that today, right? When we try to take the scooter up these hills, the, the, the torque on these engines and the throttle sensitivity is uh, too gross to be able to handle the very, very subtle speed changes right, that occur. Like, Beige, how are we going to do this? How are we going to find TJ this year on a limited source of training partners right, who will never get tired? 
who will take hit after hit after hit, and then hit back and hit back and knee him in the nuts and just <laughs> take this whole thing to a whole another level. And that solution came in the form of X-Pro bike racer Tim Johnson on an e-bike. It worked out better than if we actually did have another train partner, right? It worked better than the scooter. It worked better than having a whole Peloton. It was totally controlled. And it basically revolutionized all of the options that we had in preparing for the Tour de France. Um, and at the end of the day, when I look at the power output that I do, right, I'm using you know, a pair of power tap pedals to measure my power output. I'm doing more work. I'm working harder than I would be if I was riding a normal road bike by myself, right? Because now I've got, a, I've got someone to spar with. Right? And I've got this kind of sense of competition. And so uh, for the first time in my life, by actually employing e-bikes and training, I was actually getting more fit. And so typically, to give you some metrics, a six hour day with about 10 to 12,000 feet of climbing, with the athletes themselves doing about 5,000 kilojoules worth of work. So that's almost 1,000 kilojoules an hour. This is hard work. Um, a guy like Tim would probably have to change off the battery twice. And a guy like myself, I'd probably have to change off the battery two or three times. Right? We'll start carrying, you know, panniers with supplies, water bottles, extra clothing, etc. And this will be our single vehicle. What's really cool is that it reduces our carbon footprint training, right? It improves my fitness and my ability to be out there on the road. Um, there's not all this fumage coming up and hitting the riders. Mm -hmm. And what's really cool as a trainer is that it's so quiet when you're on these bicycles training with these guys that you can hear everything. And you can hear their breathing. You can hear those intensity changes. And they can talk and have a conversation with you. And you can practice these very, very specific race scenarios. But my guess is that as teams start the next season, I don't think there will be a single World Tour team that isn't also employing a fleet of e-bicycles so that they can train their athletes. And just, you know, standard vehicles that start using phone as a key. And it's not just a phone app. It recognizes that it's you. It can tell by you and the way you walk that it's you and not somebody else. And here we are, 100 years later, 100 and uh, three years, uh, 13 years later, I can do the math, 113 <laughs> years later, it's the same trend. You know, Bosch started with the e-bike drive unit, but then it was the battery system, it was the display system, it was the controls, now it's, it's the ABS, it's the connectivity. The drive unit was where we started, and we see that e-bikes are helping enable another part of mobility. And we're, we're starting to deal with the technology infrastructure, the amount of spins that we're getting in terms of next generation product, it's happening faster. The battery packs are getting bigger um, and uh, we're getting more power out of the systems. Uh, we're, getting, we're figuring out how to, how to uh, have more connectivity on the system. And we're, but the other part we need to do is also start talking about where do we go next in terms of working together. So it's not just the e-bike experience, it's the ride experience, it's the service experience, it's the regulation, it's the infrastructure. And it all needs to come together in order for it to really accelerate. Why specifically do you think it's important for EMTV racing to flourish? I, I, I mean, I hate saying this because I don't really think it, uh, <laughs> it wasn't so much about the racing, it was more about, um, just getting my my family, my family all races, my 11 year olds, my my friends. Um, it's just we we go out and we have a good time. You know, it's it's hard to pedal at seven or eight thousand feet. You just have to do a cross country, and I know me and Lee did that quite a bit for the last 20 years here, 30 years here, and um, it's just a, a fun experience. First of all, we started with just having fun and uh, having fun in a recreational race and not too super serious. But now that we got pro uh, riders and we got UCI, we got a world championship, uh, now we have to take it serious. And I think the biggest issue that we have to take care of is uh, tempering or tuning, manipulation of the cutoff speed. 
this is really an issue and this um, can become an issue because if we don't have this under control, then maybe the sport comes into uh, to the wrong perspective. It becomes a little path of the wrong image. So uh, I'm absolutely 100% for EMTB. I think they're amazing and it changed my husband's life completely. We didn't ride a bike for many years and they got my husband back on a bike. Um, so I think that there's definitely a place for it uh, as far as the racing goes. I, I me mean, personally, I feel like it's kind of happened so quickly that it's hard to really form an opinion because I haven't been involved enough at like yeah. this level. Yeah, for me, I focus on education and, and I feel like uh, this past year in 2019, uh, I'm an acoustic mountain bike instructor and um, so I put on lots of events around the country. Um, I do a lot of private instruction and this year I've had an increase um, in private instruction with e-bikes specifically in all women. I've had all women um, uh, reach out to me for Ian MTV instruction. And the one thing I've learned is that there is an area where it's super important to educate these riders. This industry doesn't really have a great YouTube presence on proper education. Um, and uh, these bikes are more technical than even an acoustic mountain bike, e EMTB. And I think it's super important that we throw energy towards education. And, and maybe then maybe racing makes more sense. You know, I think racing brings on, like, and I've spoken with quite a few people here, what racing does is it helps make better products. We know that racers will help develop the best products in the world. So I'm 100% for racing at any level. We also work on programs. Now I'm gonna talk really big picture here. One of our major, major points that we're addressing over the next few years is the future of bicycling at its core, and that's kids. And I gotta tell you guys, it's not good right now. Remember, most kids went to school by walking, bus, or bike. Now it's about 13%. Everybody else gets driven to school. 87% of kids get driven to school. So, we were charged by our chairman and our board, uh, which is indeed made up of industry folks, to arrest this issue, or at least begin to understand this issue. Because we know there's a lot of good things happening out there. There's trips for kids, there's Little Bells, there's Nika, there's all of the things that you guys know at the local level as well, grassroots stuff. But what we really want to come up with is a cyclist's life cycle. Um, somebody, somewhat tactfully I guess, called this a diapers to diplomas program. So there's a couple of things going on. First of all, there's the safety issue. I'm not talking about unsafe places to ride because that is frankly the core of the issue. Uh, it's, it's, as you know, most, most of the places we live now, um, there aren't sufficient safe infrastructure environments for kids to ride. But there's also, there's a perception that the kid is going to be um, at risk in other ways, shall we say. Our main mission and our focus, shall we say, is to really get people riding more often by creating safe environments. So a lot of people say, hey, what do you do about um, um, distracted drivers. Well, let's build a safer riding environment so that's not as much of an issue. That's kind of our um, solution to a lot of different things. And it works, and I'll tell you why. I took, um, we took a group of uh, city planners and architects from several cities in the United States to Copenhagen. Anyone been to Copenhagen? Okay, Copenhagen is ridiculous in terms of its um, bicycle infrastructure. It wasn't always that way. They had crowded downtowns uh, downtown areas crowded with cars as little as 40 years ago, but they made a decision to create a bike infrastructure as a priority. So we took 150 picture this, right? So me and four or five other people in a city with 150 American business people, most of whom don't ride, and of course we did use e-bikes for a lot of this, and we're taking them like uh, like uh, on a school. Uh, excursion through the city of Copenhagen. The first day was frankly kind of a bit of a shit show. Um, but as the day, as it went on, the second day, we started noticing the bikes were missing. We're like, what's going on? Where is it? <coughs> We're supposed to be at a seminar like you guys are now, listening to us speak. What they were doing, they were actually outright. 
And we thought, boom, right there. That's proof of concept. You take, you create an infrastructure, and you put people who don't ride, and all of a sudden after day one, they feel safe. And if, what if there was a way to connect the rider with a positive experience from the beginning and to connect them with other riders? So, thanks to our friends here at Bosch, we have been doing exactly that. Creating, or let's just say overcoming barriers for used to be riders, new riders, folks that are just interested but they're very concerned about their situation. And RideSpot enables you to do that. You can download it from the Google Play or your Apple Store right now, it's free. And it's also a social media platform for specifically for bikers. I want to underline this in triple bold. This is not Strava. This is the complete opposite of Strava. No one cares how often you ride, no one cares how fast you are. This is about getting more people out there enjoying what we're doing and overcoming those barriers for selling bikes. The other cool thing I can do with it is actually run challenges. I can create, um, um, sorry, repeat customers out of various events. I could run virtual demos. I can highlight partners like, here's a cool coffee shop. Um, here's uh, a great offer that we have from you know, another company that's uh, involved on this platform. So those are our highlights from Bosch's fifth anniversary for their e-bike systems. Do not forget to subscribe to this channel so that you can stay up to date on all electric bike news and content. And I would highly recommend going to check out our Gary Fisher video so you can see his perspective on the e-bike industry.